around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here today. We'd like to take the opportunity to welcome each of you to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Thank you for allowing me to come into your home and share the word of the Lord. I thank you for this time that we can share together, that we can be together in the spirit of God. I may not physically be where you are, but the Holy Ghost is right where you are. And we both have the word of God. You and I both have God's word and we can fellowship. We can grow strength or gain strength strength, gather strength from one another. And I pray each week the telecast is a blessing to you. I thank you so very much for everyone that supports this ministry. A dear brother wrote me a few weeks ago from Georgia, and he said, I wish you would ask for support. He said, the people of God need to support the work of God. But as you well know, we don't ask for money. But if you feel led and unctioned by the Spirit of God to help us, I thank you so very much for even the consideration. But we're here to preach the Word of God. As long as God will give me breath and strength, I will never compromise His Word. I will commit my life, and I have, completely and totally to the Lord and His Word and not compromise it in any capacity. That's the problem with America today. There's entirely too much compromise in every facet of our lives, and sadly, compromise is found in many pulpits in America. We want to start a new series entitled, Why We Are Able to Stand. Why you and I are able to stand. I want to take my scripture text from Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. May God add his blessings to the holy writ. Why we are able to stand. I want to encourage everyone today that's watching the telecast. Sadly, Tragically, but as long as you and I are incarcerated in these clay jars, these earthen vessels, we're going to have perpetual battles within our lives. Satan is going to use everything that he can here in the time of the end to hinder you. Satan has the world in his hands. He's after the people of God. He's after the church, the body of Christ. He's after that which is godly and righteous and holy. And he seeks to hinder every one of us relative to our walk in Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan 
hindered us. The Apostle Paul, as dynamic and as, as great a man of God as he was, he admitted Satan was hindering him. I believe if Satan can hinder the Apostle Paul, he can certainly hinder you and I. Here's a man that wrote 13 epistles who taught us about the nine gifts of the Spirit, the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost. Those gifts operated fluidly in his life. Paul the Apostle raised a young man from the dead, Eutychus. Paul had the touch of God on his life, and yet he said, Satan hindered me. Let me go back and quote that again. 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. The word hindered there in the Greek means to distract, to harass, to impede the child of God. It goes on to say, to be hindered means to be detained and even to the degree where one is cut or injured or wounded. Needless to say, Paul was whipped five times with 40 stripes save one, 39 stripes. He was literally physically cut and wounded in his flesh as a child of God. Why did Satan do that to the Apostle Paul? He was trying to hinder Paul. He was trying to negate God's plan in Paul's life. Don't think the devil will not seek to impede, harass, detain, harm, and injure you as well. As long as you are a child of God, Satan is going to fight you profusely. You will not be relieved from this spiritual battle until you take your last breath or Jesus Christ splits the eastern sky. Whether we die and we go by the way of the grave or Jesus returns and we are alive, then and only then will the battles and the intensity of warfare cease and the lives of the child of God. You cannot do this in your flesh. You cannot defeat the enemy in your flesh. You are not able to do what needs to be done. I think about David there in Psalms 39 verse 5. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Let me quote that again. Verily every man at his best state, is altogether vanity. What, what does it mean to be vain? Worthless, empty, void, vacuity. Every man at his best state, in his mind, in his body, when it comes to fighting and warring against Satan, is vain. But through the power of the Word of God, and the power of the Holy Ghost, the saints of God can withstand the onslaught of the enemy. That's why Paul prefaced this passage here in Ephesians 6 and 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. My God, give me the power and the might of God Almighty. Give me the power and the might of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, and I can overcome the devil, amen. But in myself, I cannot do that. Psalms 118 verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Let me break that down. Too many people have self-confidence. Too many people trust in their flesh. I appreciate the confidence that people have in me. I appreciate the voluminous amounts of prayer requests I get every week, whether phone calls, letters, or emails. People are constantly petitioning me to pray for them. While I'm on the subject of prayer, let me say this. 
I can and I will pray for you, but I cannot do your praying for you. Let me say that again because I want you to get that statement. God put that in my spirit 40 years ago. I can pray for you, but I cannot do your praying for you. I cannot do your intercessory prayer for you. You have to be committed to that yourselves. As I said, I get prayer requests every week. You can't imagine some of the prayer requests, the things that people petition me to pray for in their behalf. So David said, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Put your faith, put your trust, and you pray to Jesus Christ because men are limited. As a man, I am profusely limited in my skills and my faculties, but there are no limitations on God Almighty. I get tired. You get tired. Many of you watching, you're tired. You are fatigued. Why? Because of the intensity of the battle. But you have to keep on keeping on. You got to keep pressing onward. You, you can't fall by the wayside and quit and give up. Some of you have thought lately about quitting, about giving up. If you quit, if you give up, where are you going? Who are you going to turn to? I, I don't see how sinners in this world can survive without a relationship with Jesus. Oh, blessed be his holy name. I can get an audience with God right. I can stop right now and start praying and God will hear me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalms 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are opened unto their cries. I can stop right now recording this telecast and start praying, and God will hear me. I can get an audience with God anytime I so choose. And how we forfeit that old gospel song, take everything to the Lord in prayer, how we forfeit the privilege of prayer. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in this studio. I feel the presence of God. God says, you can touch the hem of my garment if you get hungry. If you get thirsty. If you press in, God said, you can touch me and I will touch you. How hungry are you for a touch of God? How hungry are you for a manifestation of God? How much are you longing for God to be in your life and to move fluidly and fervently in your heart, your home, your family, your marriage, every aspect of your life? Do you want God moving there? Then take the time to pray and God Almighty will help you. I read an article years ago. A reporter was interviewing Billy Graham. And the reporter said, if you could go back in life and you could change anything relative to your ministry and how you serve the Lord, what would you change? He said, I would have spent more time in prayer. I would have spent more time in prayer. You know, we suffer many times because we didn't pray. I'm telling you, prayer will keep the hordes and the hounds of hell at bay. Prayer can push back the demonic entities and forces that are trying to encroach and impede your life. Hell wants to come into your home, your family, your marriage, but prayer, Holy Ghost, fervent prayer will keep that at bay. James 5, 16 said, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, availeth much, I'm not talking about courtesy prayer. I'm not talking about prayer when you sit down to your supper and you say, God, I thank you for this food. I thank you for the day. I thank you for the fellowship, etc." I'm talking about old-fashioned Holy Ghost intercessory prayer in your closet, in your bedchamber, out there in the shed, in the backyard, and you get a hold of the horns of the altar of God and you commune with God and God communes with you. That's lost today. 
people used to pray and God would touch them. Hot tears would stream down their faces. They agonized. My God, there was a day when, a, when an old Baptist church sounded like a birthing ward, a birthing chamber where women were groaning and, and toiling and travailing and prevailing. That's how it should sound in the church today. But that sound is gone because that's old-fashioned. I don't know where I saw it or someone sent it to me, but a mega church on Super Bowl Sunday, the church was in the state of Ohio, and they were acting like they were having the game, the physical game of the Super Bowl. And they teed up a Bible, and they kicked the Bible like they were kicking a football. Let me say this. Anybody that sat in that church, endorsed that, embraced that, you, my friend, are on the precipice of becoming an apostate. How dare anybody make the Word of God? They had a physical Bible. And they put it on the floor just like that. Someone came up and kicked it like they were kicking a football through a field goal. That's a reprobate. That's not a shepherd. That's not a pastor. That is somebody who doesn't honor God, does not regard God, does not even respect the Word of God. Job, in Job 23, 12, he said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said the Bible, the Word of God, the Scriptures of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're more valuable to me than the food that I eat, the, the food that I need for physical sustenance. He said, the word of God, I esteem it. I regard it. I laud it. I extol it more than the food that I eat. Where is that in the church today? The majority, the scope and the range of most of our battles are in our minds. Satan plagues the mind of every believer. That's why if you will go on here in this sixth chapter of Ephesians, Paul talked about putting on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation will thwart the fiery darts of hell as they come to pervade and permeate your mind. We've all been sitting at a stoplight. We've all been by ourselves. We may have been around a lot of people, but we were reclusive in our mind. We were, we were, we were uh, isolated in our mind. And all of a sudden, here comes a fiery dart from hell, a perverse, a perverted, an ungodly thought came through your mind. And you said, where did that come from? How did that come to my mind? I'll tell you how. It was a fiery dart from hell to put something into your mind to get you to react to it. Oh, Satan is so cunning. Genesis 3, 1, and the serpent was more subtle than all the beasts of the field. That hissing, lying, deceptive serpent. And that's always been Satan's methodology. Always been his mode, his means, his method is to deceive and to manipulate the child of God. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, Paul said, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Salvation, serving Christ, loving Christ, honoring Christ. Children can do that. Children can do that. A three-year-old, a four-year-old can sing 
Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That's the simplicity. That, that's what Paul is talking about. But he said, I have fear. I have anxiety. I have consternation. Lest that by any means Satan will corrupt you and corrupt your thinking, your understanding relative to the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, Satan always tries to work in our minds. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it absolutely amazing how we can believe everything Satan says to our minds, but we grapple to believe what God the Holy Ghost says to our minds. The Holy Ghost says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to fix this. I'm going to heal your home. I'm going to heal your marriage. I'm going to bring that prodigal back. I'm going to make restoration in your life. Somehow we grapple, we struggle profusely to hear that clearly and correctly, but we hear everything Satan says and we react to it in a negative way. We become despondent. We become dejected. We become fearful. Uh, we, 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 we let our, our, our thoughts and our imaginations then run even more wild, making it more catastrophic, making it more disastrous, making it more calamitous. That's the work of the enemy. Philippians 2, 5, Paul said, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. <laughs> God wants you to have the mind of the Holy Ghost. God wants you to have the mind of the Spirit of God. But as we get further and further and further here into the time of the end, Satan is going to plague the minds of the world and every child of God that he can. He's going to plague the minds with more fear, anxiety, and trepidation. Jesus, when he's talking about the time of the end, in the 21st chapter of Luke, beginning at verse 25, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. Listen to me closely. There are things that are coming upon the earth that are going to perplex and trouble the minds of men as never before. Distress of nations. That word distress in the Greek means anxiety, anxiety, fear, anguish, trepidation. Please do not be offended, but you don't need psychotropic drugs for your mind. You need the Holy Ghost. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. I, I don't take any kind of medication, thank God. I'm 69 years of age. I take my supplements. But I don't take any kind of medication. Some may think I need it. Some may think Brother Lankford could use some psychotropic drugs because his mind is skewed. But thank God I don't take them. Why, why am I addressing this? Because Satan wants you dependent on something else other than Jesus. I know what it means to get under distress. In, in the year of 2000, my grandmother died on February the 4th. My mother died February the 22nd. My dad passed away on March the 18th. In 45 days, I had three funerals of, of the people closest to me, my family. And I'm not going to get into all the details, but my dad had had a stroke. He fell. He burst his head. 
He was on blood thinners, and he bled to death. Exsanguation, he bled out. It, it, was, it, was, it was horrific, the sight. And Satan was trying to bring fear into my life. And I even said to God, are one of my children about to die? Listen, I know what the devil can do to a man's mind. I went into a state and a place of insomnia. I could not sleep for weeks. It was nearly two months. I'm talking about I could not sleep. When the police came to my home where I was keeping my dead, there were 14 police vehicles in the yard. Detectives, coroner, you name it. They, were, they stamped my hands and my blood, my wife's hands for gunpowder residue to see if we shot my father. I know about distress. I know about perplexity. And I will never forget this. Insomnia seized my mind. I couldn't sleep. And I remember getting on my knees. And I said, God, if you don't help me, I'm going to go to a doctor and get some sleeping pills. But you know what? When I prayed that night, I went to sleep. God gave me rest. David said he gives his beloved rest. I went to the master. I went to the source. I went to the one who could give me sleep and cause me to rest. Thus, I never did take a sleeping pill. I don't need that. I have Jesus and so do you. He is the Prince of Peace. He's the master of the sea. He still walks on the water. He's still the God of all flesh. Trust him. Believe him. Pray. My God, I can't emphasize it overly enough. Pray. Talk to God. And God will help you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. You're nothing but a child in his eyes. Let the Heavenly Father give you rest. Give you strength and give you peace. God bless you. We love you. I'll see you next week. Please pray for us. Keep this ministry on your heart and prayers. Thank you. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502 Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.